Good evening, everyone. My name is Alexandra Cunningham Cameron, and I'm the Curator of Contemporary Design and Hint Secretarial Scholar at Cooper Hewitt. I have had the honor of organizing the Willie Smith Street Couture Exhibition, Monograph, and Digital Community Archive with a large and dedicated team at the museum, including Darnell Jamal Lisby, Julie Pastor, as well as Willie Smith's family, friends, and collaborators, uh, with principal support from Target. You're joining us today for Rebellion in Design, the second program in the Willie Smith series. The first, Collective Memory, Storytelling and Collaboration in the Writing of History is available on the Cooper Hewitt YouTube channel. If you haven't seen it, I highly encourage you to track it down. My introduction to Willie Smith came through one of our speakers today, James Wines, who is a founding partner of Site Architects and together with Alice and Sky, designed a series of showrooms and boutiques for Willie Wear. These were spaces that signaled transformation and rebirth for Smith's broad audience, everyone from downtown club kids to suburban homemakers. And we've been extremely lucky to have James in collaboration with Sam Shumayev Architects bring this energy to the exhibition architecture, which I hope you'll have the opportunity to see in person once the museum opens later this fall. Today, James will be speaking with two people who share his affinity for mischief and disruption, uh, Virgil Abloh and Iwana Stanescu, about a subject that is at the top of Willie Smith's design agenda, creating new spaces for invention, rebellion, and collaboration. The talk is in a webinar format, so we welcome you to take part in the discussion using the chat box. And at the end of the hour, we'll open it up for live questions and comments. To do this, we'll ask that you navigate to the bottom of your screen and choose the option to raise your hand. And you'll be invited to unmute so you can ask a question aloud in real time. You can also submit questions through the Q&A box um, and the program will provide live captioning. Now I can't help but smile as I introduce our moderator, Juana Stanescu, someone whose work and spirit I've deeply admired for a long time and seen up close to her wide ranging and interdisciplinary practice. Uh, Juana is a Romanian architect who lives and works between Berlin and New York and who is interested in the spatial translation of ideas and environments as reflections of culture at large. And most recently, she's nominated for the 2019 MoMA PS1 Young Architects Program. Her projects include Plus Pool, a floating water filtering swimming pool, it's real, as well as a wide range of collaborations with Nike, MoMA, Virgil Abloh, the Office of Play Lab, 2x4, Arup, New Museum, Storefront for Art and Architecture, Need Supply, Fool's Gold, Kanye West, and many more. Her current projects include the reconversion of a 500 meter long funicular into a public park in Romania and a house in Canada. She also writes um, and occasionally teaches at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. James, Virgil, and Juana, thank you for sharing your time and ideas with us today. Uh, take it away, Juana. Thank you, Alexandra. And let's see, is Virgil with us? Hey. Well, it's an absolute pleasure and honor to be here tonight, here in my office, but to have you all <laughs> joining me. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce James Wines and Virgil Abloh. Uh, for uh, those of you less familiar with James's work, I'm very jealous of you because I distinctly remember the day in architecture school when I came upon his work. And I knew at the time there was no going back anymore. So thank you, James, for, for making some dents, important dents in my education. James is an American artist and architect. He is co-founder alongside with Alison Skye of, uh, and president of SITE, which is an architecture and environmental art studio, which is internationally known for its um, urban interior design product architectural projects. And then there's my good friend Virgil. I think it's fair to say that we're both students of James in different ways. Uh, Virgil and I go back quite a while, probably like a decade ago, although this year feels like a decade, so that technically makes <laughs> it something. Uh, he most recently introduced himself as an avid whatever, which is a probably pretty accurate description, but having a, dis a degree in civil engineering and architecture, he navigates between the realms of art, design, and culture at large. 
He's currently Chief Creative Director and founder of Off-White and Men's Artistic Director at Louis Vuitton. But the reason we are all here tonight is really Willie Smith and the exhibition on Willie Smith called Street Couture at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, which is hopefully going to open soon. Until then, though, I do want to point out two things. One, I think it's going to be posted in chat, but there's this incredible website, which is willismitharchive.cargo.site. You have to check it out. I kind of gave up on websites a while ago, but it's a truly amazing and really incredible resource. And in addition to that, I also strongly recommend this book on the exhibition, Willie Smith Street Couture. I'm totally geeking out over this book. Um, and partially, and the reason behind it is because it tells us the story of Willie, but not in an institutionalized way, but really you hear from his family, his collaborators, uh, his peers, uh, and they, they paint the story of, you know, a real character. They, they sometimes contradict each other. Um, and, and what emerges is really this incredibly free creative spirit, incredibly just authentic and open to the world. But of course, being a young black gay man, uh, that means that openness wasn't always returned. Yet reading the story, you never really get a sense that he lost you know, any sense of faith or, or, or orientation for that matter. So what happens is when, what happened for me at least, uh, when I read the book, you just get an incredible sense of joy, just a spirit. And that's a very elusive feeling in 2020. I don't know for you, but I can certainly say that for me. And um, James, I'm curious, you designed the exhibition, but more importantly, you also designed a few of his showrooms. Oh, sorry, you designed the exhibition together with Sam Charmaev, but you also designed a few showrooms for Willie Smith, as well as his office back in the day. Did you, did you guys have fun? Oh, a lot of fun. <clears throat> I mean, uh, yeah, I, Willie is not only a remarkable character in, the, in terms of integrating the arts, but uh, he was a great spirit. And, and I, I think the, the most significant thing, having an exhibition of his work right now is that he was the pinnacle of, of this integrating systems, integrating people, integrating ideas, integrating the arts. It's, it's something that he was really a pioneer as part of it, as well as a great fashion designer. And he was just a joy to be with. He was absolutely uh, amazing. We, 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 when we started working on him, his showrooms and his, his environments, um, you know, he, I knew that he was working with other artists, but I had no idea to what extent. And uh, he really touched on not only fashion design, but he brought in other fields so that they, it, it, was a, it became this total fusion of systems. Plus he was also, of course, a street artist and loved to see his fashions in the, in the public domain. Uh, hopefully social distancing will soon end and the Willie spirit will come back in full flower because it, it was a remarkable period. And I think in a sense, what, what America should be about. Hello? Yeah, we were. <laughs> no, I thought I lost you. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that's basically, I mean, what I would do as an introduction. Yeah. Uh, I think it's mainly the relevance of his work. And, um, the, the spirit behind it, as it, it, I think we talked about earlier, um, he is he, he essentially symbolic of our times. He's more relevant than ever because where would you find a person who is into fusing the arts, he's into the streets, he's into the, the commonplace, you know, transforming uh, ideas, uh, you know, integrating the arts with across the fields, including dance and performance and theater and painting and sculpture. Uh, he's an African-American, a leading African-American. And uh, he is, finally, he was a, a gay designer. So he's, in a sense, the embodiment of, of everything that's in the news today. And uh, Alexander Cameron's selection to have the show as I say, it just couldn't be more pertinent and couldn't be more relevant at the time. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you, James, of course. 
Um, and I think you're right in saying that we're basically inhabiting a world that was made possible by Willis Smith and other pioneers like him, whose stories we don't always kind of uh, get to know. So in this case, I think we're particularly, particularly fortunate. And what one thing that's really compelling is you get a sense that he was breaking all rules of fashion or all other fields for that matter, and doing so laughingly almost. Uh, or completely ignoring them for that matter. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious because, you know, just coming back to this notion of joy and or fun or playfulness or humor, that's a, that's a common trait in, in your and in Virgil in your work too. That's sure. But also in Virgil's work, I mean, we have a great deal in common because again, I, I, we really start with the commonplace, with the ordinary, with the, uh, the, the, something that is recognizable to everywhere uh, by shape or volume or texture or color or whatever. It, it, it's common. And then we apply to it another sensibility, something that transforms it, gives it another level of meaning. And that is very important. And Willie was, was part of that as well. He was always trying to put fashion in another context and see it in a different way. Totally. Um, I, I think partially why I, I wanted to start off with that was also because at least in architecture, for sure, the word fun is like a dirty word that one is not allowed to use, uh, along with 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 a bunch of with a bunch of other ones. Uh, Virgil, I'm curious if you had anything to add to that. I'm sorry. No. I said no completely. Um, you know, to even enter this conversation about design. Um, in our moment moving forward, you know, you have to highlight uh, a figure like Willie Smith, because there's always in history a predecessor. You know, there's always a lens that's just before now that might be in super focus. And I think, uh, Awana, you highlighted a few things like, you know, is it rule breaking or being oneself? You know, what is diversity in design? You know, these questions that we're asking ourselves, what is, what, what is a designer? You know, what is art? What is architecture? What is fashion? Um, as we know, and as the world around us swirls around this idea of representing more people than just the people that participate, what you often get is a, a nomenclature that says, oh, you're breaking rules, you're having too much fun, you're not respecting the past. Et cetera, et cetera. And, and you see in Willie's body of work how he's just free. You know, it's very similar to, you know, taking a kid to a restaurant or a movie or, or a gallery exhibit and telling him not to touch the art. You know, and it's like you see that when you bring a new energy or, or sort of like an energy that can progress the, the system forward the almost immediate reaction is to touch the art. And, and you could call that breaking the rules, but you could also call that sort of expressing oneself. So to me, um, you know, the context for this conversation is quite vital because we're talking about designer, we're talking about through the lens of Willie, but also talking about architecture. So there's a number of ways we can go. There's a... Um... There's one quote that I want to throw out there to what both of you are speaking, and it's by Peter McQuaid, who's a writer, and he writes in the book. It's, it's a bit of a long quote, so you have to bear with me, but it's worth it. Uh, he was dating Willie at the time and, and was complaining about not making it uh, professionally, and Willie told him, um, or, or he basically tells the story of saying, I listened as he explained that the reason his name was on the sign outside has had nothing to do with some magical blend of ego and self-confidence, but because he found it impossible to do his best work in a rigid 7th Avenue environment. He knew because he had tried. In other words, there are those amongst us who will never fit in. It's not a question of wanting to or not wanting to, it's just not possible. If you are one of those people, you are going to have to figure out another way to do things because the normal way is not going to work. You'll have to work harder and probably fail some, but the rewards are greater. If you're older, you know what I'm saying is true. If you're younger, you're welcome. 
And I, I'll, meanwhile, I'll let you guys run off of that. I'll just share the, a couple of um, slides on, on Willie's work, but then also you guys collaborated recently and, and showing some of those pro the project that you also did together. Yeah, James, in the era that you guys first connected, can you paint a picture of New York and the, the ecosystem that you guys were inputting ideas into? Yeah, it was really uh, that period when, uh, you know, the whole art world was shifting. You know, it was kind of moving away from pop art and far more into performance art and environmental art. So uh, some of my best friends were over on the Bowery, which was the, the main you know, performance center. And I was in Soho, which is the main center of environmental artists. And uh, there was a lot of dialogue going on, a lot of uh, exchange of ideas. And, and it, it, it was a, just an amazing period because uh, in, in a sense, all of the artists after pop art were all trying to get out of the gallery. The whole idea was to flood into the streets and we did it in a way very naively and we did it with, with a lot of energy, but the idea was just to burst forth and, and uh, get out. As, you know, Bob Smith was always calling attention to the back. You walk into a gallery and there's all those lights and all those pedestals and all those frames, and you know exactly what to expect. In other words, no matter any, anything, no matter how outrageous, as long as it was on a pedestal or in a frame or on a wall or in a gallery, you you were already preconditioned to accept that. So the rebellious spirit of that time was just get out of the gallery altogether. A, a good friend of mine, Alice Aitok, is an amazing environmental artist that lives next door to me still, or before in Sofa anyway, I moved out of Sofa now. But uh, we always just kind of commiserate and said, oh, we should have just stuck with, you know, three feet, four foot paintings, because all of the artists who continued in the more conventional frame of reference, you know, became millionaires and we were always struggling because we were always trying to figure out how to do it in the landscape or in the streets or, so there, it, it was not an economically advantageous move, but it was again, part of that rebellion, part of, can you get out of that, those, those constraints and do something else? Is there some other way we can do it? Amazing. In regards to fashion making, like, was there, was Willie one that was trying to sort of find a space within that community or was he more bent on sort of bridging uh, the community between art and fashion, uh, et cetera? Well, I think he too, in a funny way, was, you know, what he, he asked me to design spaces where I said, the last thing I want to do is look like Ralph Lauren. And it's really true. He didn't want to be precious looking. He wanted to be, you know, fun looking. He wanted to have something enjoyable, something different, whatever it was. And uh, that was a, it. Was a, it was just this, the spirit of the times. It had to. It just couldn't be conventional. So we. He loved the streets. So we just dragged the streets into the showroom. And. Um, but he, he touched off a lot of things. I, I, you know, I, I, I know in working for, for you recently, I mean, you, you fell in love with invisibility and it's hard to photograph. I'm still waiting for great photographs, but uh, to, to really kind of express that idea of seeing through everything. And so that anything opaque in that kind of environment pops out into space. And uh, Willie would have loved that idea. It's just, I didn't have it at that time, but it's interesting to, to speculate that, that, you know, if you just look at any art form or any situation, there's always another way to do it. There's always something, uh, another dimension of that idea, no matter how simple. I always say, you know, tell students and young artists, just go back to the dumbest thing you ever thought of. Just <laughs> start with that. Don't, don't try to be fancy. Just start with a dumb thing and that will, you know, expand and, 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 and become something else. Something interesting about your work is you've gone really international. I, I don't really can be 
considered really an international, he's far more a, a, an American phenomenon. But you managed to take this kind of inversion of situation and rethinking fashion to a global, on a global level, which is amazing too. It's another whole process and also made possible by, by the digital age and by communication and by everything. Yeah, indeed. You know, and and for my generation, carrying the torch from Willie and the community that you guys were fostering downtown was obviously this, there's something to that parallel of breaking out of the system and just existing on the street. You know, what happens when you stand on the street? You sort of get this barrier, like this image here showcases of everyday reality meets like the theory that's happening in the galleries or the systems or the institutions. Yeah. Um, you know, and it was just particularly, I look at these images and I see how they were communicating an energy at a specific time. And I see the real value of fashion. You know, fashion is almost sort of like, it, it's like a, a telegram or a telephone call, no matter what the technology is, it communicates an idea of a generation. Yeah. And I see, in his work, you know, the foundations for, for my generation, my work. And I also see it through the lens of being African-American, you know, black and, you know, expressing oneself through the sort of uh, the lexicon of one's own ideas. Yeah, yeah that one thing that uh, always amazed me about Willie, I mean, being African-American, he never seemed to have any chip on his shoulders. He, I mean, he didn't have a, a you know, angry agenda. His idea was just the more integrated you become, the better it is. And and I think that that's, that's certainly, I get what you've been part of, but very much so. But, but it is, he did kind of eloquently uh, express that spirit. I mean, not only his personal life, his friends and the selection of, uh, but, even when we would talk together and go look for junk around the city and 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 go to the west side to some of the clubs there and and he, he was you know I, I i don't ever remember having a conversation where we were talking about the agonies i mean he seemed to be a person who if there's any agony it was just doing better which was a a, a great a great characteristic i I was listening the other evening to that incredible concert by, uh, you know, the, the, the um, um, oh, now I'm missing, I'm missing my thought process here um, at Woodstock. And I was thinking of all the people who were in that, in that um, whole situation and, and every one of them just, you know, you don't have to rationalize anything. You, it was just the quality came through, and it, it was just—it was so spectacular. It was so it was so moving, and and and, and I feel like that characteristic, it, it, you know, is it's something that's in every culture. I mean, you know, African American culture certainly has dominated aspects of our culture for, for many many years in terms of invention and ideas. And the more that is emphasized, the more that is brought out. The, the less, you know, friction I think there'll be in the society. Just overpower the society with the quality of the work and, and the rest take care of itself. I've always felt that way, you know. I you know, listened to Prince for the first time. I mean, it was just it was extraordinary. I mean, I, I, I didn't, I, it takes you out of, out of any differentiation. It takes you above that, that argument in a way. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm I'm with the quotes. I'm really geeking out over this book. Sorry, so I, I just throw into the subject one because it was really powerful. By um, and I think I shared it with you, but it's by Dario Calmis, and it he says um, he's quoting Willie, who said, "You know, in the '60s and '70s, there was this tremendous exposure given to designers based on their blackness. When the hype was over, people thought we there were no more black designers. In a way, it's a blessing. Now we can get." on with being what we are, designers. 
And then Dario goes on to say that the fashion industry has repeatedly devalued the impact of black peoples and black culture. And Smith laid the groundwork for the diverse voices breaking through industry protocol today. But I mean, architecture is in many ways way worse than fashion. Virgil, you're navigating both uh, mm -hmm. and a few other fields too. Um, yeah. No, yeah, I found, you know, what Willie's tapping into a sentiment is what happens when you're a black creative and you sort of look, you look up at the mountain. I often think of the metaphor of like, if you're gonna climb out at Mount Everest, you have to stare at it every day. But then, but then imagine being a hundred miles further away from it. <laughs> you know, that's, it's all you can see. And that, that's sort of like a shorthand phrase of, you know, when these systems aren't made for the prototype to exist for a designer, and then maybe the tides change where it's like, oh, black design might be avant-garde and cool. And then they're going to pick and choose a few, you know, you, you have to go in deeper into your brain and come to terms with your purpose and path. You know, you have to, you have to absorb being the trend for the moment and not as he's relaying in his quote, or also you just have to be characterized as a box, like being put in a box. And, and what that does is it, it forces you to, to sort of, you know, I always look at the upside, I'm an optimist. <laughs> so that's a, that's a part of the sort of Trojan horse of it in order to exist. But you basically adopt this very deep rationale about the work and how it exists and the perception of the work. Um, I, for one, found the gray area in between architecture, art, music, fashion, as a sort of space that is contactless. You know, uh, you know, I ha I've had predecessors before me try to exist in these silos, and 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 much like Willie, through learning his story, I found freedom in the street, like found freedom in that edge, you know, the threshold before the establishment because there's freedom there, there's expression, there, there's an endless abyss of inspiration and real stories to be told. And, you know, being black and, and having spent time in these like higher education institution, you know, my purpose is to bring those worlds together and, and not, not even be as rebellious or as like, uh, you know, uh, a writer would love to call me a disruptor. <laughs> You know, and I think pre 2020, you can identify your categorized categorized as a disruptor when you don't fit the mold and you might be just doing, <laughs> you might be that kid in a gallery that literally just wants to see if that sculpture is really bronze or plaster or, or whatever. And, you know, all that lens of looking at Willie's career, what he created, how thoughtful he was is, um, you know, it's something I find of value as, as we call for a generation to be represented in these fields that aren't so diverse. Absolutely. I mean, James and I were talking earlier also about this, these boxes that everyone wants to keep one in and put one in and how they always come, they never come from the creative bit because in essence, the creative process is way more fluid. And in a way, it's almost there. I tend to think of architecture, for example, always in service of life as an infrastructure background to things that happen on it. But I often get confronted with uh, being my work being called or being told that my work is art, not architecture, which I find to be the biggest compliment I wish. But I also don't understand why, like why does it matter where one begins and the other one ends if there is such a thing to begin with? Like why build these walls that anyone has to kind of climb over. And James, you had some good stories about Frank Stella also being confronted with similar. Like in a way, I think every field is trying to hold on to its own uh, boxes. Well, no, I, I had mentioned before that uh, because, you know, I started with a lot of controversy. So that, that, I mean, I, it, you know, in the beginning, I remember, you know, especially in American magazines, not in Europe, but we, we somebody would publish one of our projects and always the next issue is cancel my subscription from, you know, mainstream architects. So <laughs> he endured a lot of that kind of criticism and dismissal. And, you know, that when we're talking, that's not real art or that's not real architecture. It's if there's some omnipotent category that we're not in touch with or something. 
But uh, it really is it's ridiculous. Well, I was on. The, I, I think I mentioned before we were talking that uh, I was on a panel many years ago, and it was I think with Oldenburg and and Roy Lichtenstein and Frank Sell, and I think I was the only person on it who sort of represented architecture. But the idea was the, the the theme behind it was, and I think there's a book somewhere that was published, controversy in art. Uh, but the idea was that these are all artists whose work had been dismissed in the beginning as not real art or not real sculpture or not real anything. And I found it, you know, it was amazing and really amusing, but at that, I remember Frank Stella, he was doing his pinstripe paintings of that period. And, you know, they weren't in bright colors. And so he's, his comment was, is why do critics always start, they're criticizing me because I'm not, a, I'm not a painter. They said, you know, I'm not a painter because I don't use color. And why do they always start with what you're not trying to do instead of starting with what you're trying to do and going forward from there? And I thought that was a very good comment on critics. And, and I remember Oldenburg uh, was, had a brilliant moment too. Uh, Noguchi was in the audience and was kind of trashing Oldenburg. That's not real sculpture, the usual stuff. And Oldenburg was trying to be very polite. Well, you know, it's, it's my way of doing sculpture. And he said, well, it's not real sculpture. I said, why isn't it real? And Noguchi says, wow, because it's not hard, it's not firm, it's not, you know, carved in marble and made in bronze or whatever. And uh, he said, well, you know, sometimes, you know, I'm an artist and, and I like to take risk. And, and risk is it's a lot of fun. I like to take risk. And, and so um, uh, Noguchi says, risk? What risk? I don't see any risk. What's your risk? And Oldenburg said, my risk is that you won't understand it. And that's <laughs> so true. It's the bottom line. And it, it, there just isn't enough patience, I guess, in the critical system. And it's, it's interesting, much more accepting in the society. I find far more interesting dialogue with just the general public often than you, you find with actual, you know, professionals, professional critics or professional architects or whatever. And I think we've all found that. I mean, we, we are, we've done controversial work. So the minute you do that, you, you alienate some of the, your colleagues who are more formalist or more conservative or whatever. James, you have to join my, I'm having a sort of class or project that's called non-professional, so non-professional practice. So you have to come <laughs> rile some spirits up there. But I think you're you're on point and, you know, part of previous conversation too was it's actually really easy to shit on things, pardon my language, to critique things. When I think the role actually of a critic should be to try to see where things could go towards and kind of participate to furthering the idea and furthering, you know, creativity in essence. In, in with the goal of a higher purpose as opposed to just kind of knock things down, which is it's, it's quite an easy thing to do for that matter and also doesn't bring anything to anyone except uh, for- it's just that There's not an effort and they, and they want to, they tend, critics tend to want to solidify whatever they think. Right. And it's usually solidified by kind of an academic sensibility. It's usually derived from that world. Like if there's enough examples or if there's uh, a movement afoot or something, they'll latch on. And then, you know, they won't change their mind. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I, my favorite quote, I use it in almost every lecture is that Oscar Wilde, an idea that isn't dangerous, isn't worthy of being called an idea. And that's mm -hmm. so true. <laughs> I mean, all ideas, are really good ideas are dangerous. And uh, I mean, the greatest idea of all time, I guess, is the theory of relativity. And that was dangerous for most of Einstein's life. So I don't think we have to be afraid of, it, of ideas. I mean, they're, they're the bottom line for everything. And I think what's important is like, we're having this conversation in 2020. You know, if we have this conversation in 2019, uh, us as creators, the three of us, highlighting the, the the sort of rabid pill of critique, you know, I think is often the dialogue as Awana was saying, it's one of the critical points in culture that seemingly is just swallowed into the like, hey, to become successful, you deserve the critique and like kind of deal. It's like a tax, yeah. you know, but, but as we can say, like paying tax, like what are we paying tax for? <laughs> you know, what is that tax money fund? Yeah. And if we're going to sort of be up against this sort of brick wall 
of you know these um the uh you know the civil rights movements to to sort of ask for better representation or understanding how we relate to the climate you know and our our relationship to the earth etc the only thing that can change is how we view something we viewed yesterday yeah with means of progressing with means of having humanity click in some way so that we sort of solve the world's problems instead of perpetuate the rest. And I know that's a bit of a zoom out, be from fancy clothes in a window and you know buildings on the street. But James, what I love about your work and what we can ramp back into Willie is it related to everyday people, right? It didn't just relate to hollowed spaces. So James, can you tell the story about the the show the first I think you and Willie first did a window display oh yeah well no we didn't do it actually we had done a, a window display for Rizzoli which uh, it was our yeah Christmas that's window display yeah it was architectural books all architectural so we saw a big construction site right across the street on on Fifty Seventh Street so we just went across the street and got all these bricks and mortar and all that kind of stuff and we just distributed it with the window so it was a whole construction site. The window was a construction site in and in among the the materials, of course, they, they placed the books, the new architectural book. Well, I mean, this was done uh, by uh, Gianfranco Bonicelli, who was an incredible curator and visionary for Rizzoli. But um, yeah, I mean, the store designer just went apoplectic. I mean, they, they they took it away in a very short time. Because <laughs> I think he was going to quit his job or something over this. But Willie passed by the store and saw this. And so that was our introduction. He called me up and he said, yeah, I really love that, that window you did. Can you do something like that for me? So in a way, that's how it started. He, he, he really liked the junk world. And I did too, because it's, it's as I say, it's where you least expect to find art. And I, I love territories like that because they're open for exploration. If it's already, you know, a Gothic cathedral or a temple in, in uh, Greece or something, I mean, Washington DC is a, a big bore because it's all derivative and, it's, and the iconography is not really relevant anymore. And it's, it's boring, it's, just, it's, it's, it's kind of copycat art. And I don't think there's any vitality in that and, and because the art that lives on and forever and for it and keeps it alive is it was always controversial at the time of its inception always i can't think of anything that i really like that didn't have some controversy uh having lived in italy i mean look at masaccio or or michelangelo i mean they, these guys were incredibly controversial for so many reasons during their own time and they're titans of, of the history and uh you know i i listened the other evening just bringing it up to date to a tribute. It was a film made on uh, Jimi Hendrix and a uh, great fan of his. And I mean, it, it's incredible. I mean, when you, when you play like that, you don't have to have any other rationale. And yet that was very controversial. I mean, he was ragged on and dragged and, and, and many years of, of were these retail were these, were these studies that you were doing like on the street like in the retail did this this all predated were these are your early investigations until into what you would become the the architecture like more building projects before were they happening concurrently well they were happening concurrently uh i i, I always like the process i mean the reason i like construction sites i mean the process is always more interested in the finished product and that's a hard thing to accept. If you're an architect, you know, you always want to kind of hate to finish it too much. Because if you over finish it or you're over articulate it, it, it loses something. It loses something. And I feel you feel the same way about, about fashion and, and, and products and things. I mean, it's something about a rawness or an edginess or, or, or a question being asked. It's, it's always got to have something unanswered. Uh, you know, Duchamp said, I'm much more interested in the questions than the answers. And he's right. I mean, you're, it's, you know, if it, 
makes you, uh, the job, of course, is the pinnacle of that. It, it always makes you ask questions. And even to this day, you put some of his early work in a sculpture show today, and it's always the most interesting thing in the room. In fact, Giacometti and Duchamp are always the most interesting sculptors in the room, no matter who else is in the room. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and like Jimi Hendrix, I mean, Jimi Hendrix strikes 10 notes, and he's the most interesting musician <laughs> in, the, in the crowd. I mean, you can't get away from it. No, that, that reminds me too, you know, as I'm listening to these stories and I'm thinking about now and I'm, you know, I don't reflect on my own work usually ever. So, but it's a good lens, you know, 2020 is that year. I think about, you know, I just recently had a runway show and, and to me, what was more interesting is like, just wrote, I, I wrote a, a series of like, a, what, 20 or so questions and put those out as garments that I had designed, you know, and they're up oh, on my I website. That I saw that, I know, it's amazing. Like and, just- and Also, just, it, it, it's, you never forget that the body is carrying all this information. Without that, you know, the information kind of doesn't exist. So, you know, writing on the body, reshaping, I mean, all of that is inherent in the thing. It's a commentary, not only on the art of wearing something, but the body has got to be there. It's, it's yeah. always carrying you know, half of the message. And it's really <laughs> Fresh from the collection, you know. When, idea. It's basically powerful. When yeah. you do, when you find, and what I see you, I when I look at your work, I feel like you were investigating, like the architecture that maybe the industry didn't want to, to sort of acknowledge. You know, they probably wanted you to stand up straight and show in the galleries and be formal and abstract oh. and reduce and and all that. And the same as fashion in me today. It's like they would love for me to, to sort of exist in the archetype that is European oh, yeah, runway. Absolutely, I know that. Absolutely. They, 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 you want, they want to get you into some kind of box so <laughs> they, they, they can, well, usually that's a reason to, to dismiss you. If they put you in a box, then they never have to think about it again. <laughs> <laughs> they can it's go hard. on to the next box. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have a, yeah, well, I, I think we share that in common. We, we keep being refused. <laughs> Refusal. <laughs> I don't want to, I always try to not position myself against something because I feel it eventually we're giving too much bandwidth to the ones that we're, um, yeah, to the things that we disagree with. But I was curious about one thing. I wanted to bring it back to what you were saying earlier about the, the process being more exciting than the final and the questioning of everything. Um, I don't know for how it is for, for both of you, but for me actually seeking collaborations, inter or paradisciplinary collaborations are forms of questioning things because by working with someone who, for example, an artist or with an architect or something like that, I feel that my, all, my own assumptions and my own way of looking at the world um, is being questioned. And both of, your, both of your practices are incredibly collaborative. Is that also a source of questioning or, or what's in it for you in the collaboration? You seem to seek them out and you seem to be good collaborators. Well, it's very important, really, it's always important. Uh, and because that, I mean, we're doing it right. You know, I've moved my studio to my apartment and my, my middle room here is filled with people right now. So, you know, we're working, well, actually we're, <laughs> we're working for Virgil right now at this moment. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it really is interesting because, you know, now we're kind of phase where everybody's throwing out Oh yeah, I, I, I get what you mean kind of thing. And it's getting better all the time. And it really is, it's, it's, it's a dialogue, but also that helps you have that dialogue with the public. We're both in a public art. Let's face it, we are public artists. And you know, you know, we're not really exactly tuned completely for private collectors. I think you, you can appear, it can appear in a museum as we both have, but it isn't, that comfortable there. It's much more comfortable on the street or where it is, you know, wherever it exists. It's much more comfortable there because then it's it's for everybody. It's not, you know, for the art critic, it, it can be interpreted differently. It can, 
and yeah, I would say that there's there are constraints of having a large audience or having a public audience. There are constraints because you know it can't be seen or <clears throat> I guess or it can't be you gotta hurt people's feelings. It's like uh, there are certain certain game playing or certain rules of the game, but again, you stretch it as far as you can go. I mean, yeah, I think Andy Warhol said that very well, art is what you get away with. <laughs> and it's really true. I mean, it's just how far you can push the envelope. When you figure, when you finalize like those, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into the Q and A early cause it's like, I'm a student as much as a collaborator of James, but I wanna go, I wanna dial into like, when you did those string of best stores, were you like, oh, I'm, I'm like, I've discovered this new surface area between common person in a non sacred city in hollowed space? Where did that was that personally like a satisfaction, or did that just seem like another job along the way? I mean, get it from an artist standpoint, and, and I just saw the big boxes. I mean. It was it was owned by an art collector, so he at least understood the criticism of, the, of these big boxes that they were banal and they people never thought about them. And I always thought was, that putting art where you least expect to find it is exciting because here's something no one ever thinks about. So you do something to it and you start the thought process. And I always consider the highest compliment I ever got is somebody would come up and say, You know, I never thought about a building before. And that's an interesting thing, maybe that you had touched on some other dimension of that, that experience of, of enclosure or habitat or whatever. You touched on something about it that they hadn't entertained before they saw this, this object. So it's really, a, you know, I, I, I love the real world. I always like kind of things from the street and banality and, and, and what other people don't consider art. Right. It always fascinated me that, that you could do do that, and uh, and in all art forms, I like that. Where whether it's sound or whether it's words or whatever, as soon as somebody, you know, Quentin Tarantino was a, a master of script writing, and I always was amazed that if you take the common language and get that much poetry out, when it's so on the edge of being banal. I mean, if, it, if he wasn't such a great writer, it would be nothing. It's just that he says it in a way that you just, it, yeah, I've heard people say that, but they didn't say it quite that way. And so it takes on another dimension. You know. Yeah. Jimmy Hendrix I, again. I mean, every note out of Jimmy Hendrix was twisting what you thought was that art. Yeah. yeah. You do the same thing. It's, it's always twisting what everyone thought was the, acceptable format for that art, yeah. Yeah, and that's where I found voice. You know, like when you look at like, again, with the Mount Everest example, like yeah. when you look at the mountain and you look at the reinforcement of all like the, the Mount Rushmore figures and realize that none look like you, that, and I'm, I'm sure Willie had this same sentiment. And I wanna ask you about like, when you guys were just hanging out, I could see you guys like hanging out on Bowery, like, yeah. I don't know if any of you smoked, but yeah. I visualize when you guys it's like really interesting. Yeah. a sandwich. I, I wanted to, uh, well, for my entire life, interestingly enough, from high school onward, uh, virtually all of my close colleagues have either been gay or they've been African American, and both have had struggles. But not one of them ever, you know weighed down our friendship with a struggle. We always talked about the art. That's all, we, when I was with Willie, the only time he would talk a little about his personal preferences is we go to a gay club. He said, you know, I really like the ramshackle quality of the anvil, for example. I like that feeling, I like that, you know. And so we'd go in this club and, and we'd look around and yeah, yeah, I like this, this roughness or whatever. So, you know, other than saying things like that, uh, that, and then he would talk a little bit about, I mean, he definitely had a struggle. I mean, Philadelphia is not a great 
place to be born. And, and, and also at Parsons School of Design, I know he had a trouble because I was ahead of Parsons for a while and, and uh, I, I, would, I got lots of feedback and stories about that. But he really never belabored it. He never touched on it. He never, you know, and he knew I was perfectly well. I could talk about anything. I mean, I, you know, I, I could talk about anybody's struggles and be a pretty sympathetic ear. But it's just the nature, I think, of creativity is that it goes beyond that. You're right. You're looking at the mountain, you're looking at Mount Rushmore, and you say, who the hell, who the hell cares? I mean, who, it doesn't even really look like these assholes. So let's not bother. <laughs> you know, I mean, I got other things to do with my life. It's, it's, there's other things that are more interesting. And um, I think that that, that you know, it's kind of misplaced symbolism, I guess. It, you know, society gets hip, kind of in, involved with certain icons and certainly images and certain, so, but it, you know, what difference does it make? You know? I mean, really. Looks like yeah. we, uh, um, I'm, I'm being told we, we need to move to Q and A, if that's okay with, with you guys. Yeah. Yeah, we could go on for forever. So <laughs> we'll go on forever. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm just thinking uh, one thing is that he's talking to you for so long. <laughs> this is my wife. She's coming I know. In the I don't. I don't like him talking to you. <laughs> yes, he is. Pretty. You are very pretty. <laughs> We're not supposed to. Are we supposed to say that anymore? Are we supposed to? <laughs> to is that or is that? <laughs> The wife, she can say whatever she wants. Um, okay, it's a say that. No, no, I'm not being offensive. I'm not. I'm not commenting on, on beauty. I, I well, you you're really very beautiful. But she's also very and I don't like you. <laughs> All right, my wife is talking. Okay, let's go on to. Um... I think she was talking to you, Virgil. Um, <laughs> Okay, question number one. Can fashion as a non-official ramification of architecture permit an individual to come up with viable solutions for architecture in general and be considered? It's a bit of a vague. So basically, can fashion um, allow one to come up with viable solutions for architecture? Is that... Uh, that's a both we have a question, so we can move through them too. Uh, if you can, fashion you know, viable solutions for architecture. You, I think to find a backdoor into architecture, and I'm just gonna answer and say yes. <laughs> no, Not. But, I mean, any creative process, you know, it's like when you get an idea while you're running or something like that. It doesn't matter quite what you do, but I think if you have an, a, a kind of issue on your mind, it doesn't matter what if you come up with a way in by painting, writing, making fashion or anything else. Like to me, they're all one in the same in a way, serving the same purpose, unless you guys disagree. No, my, for me, it's literally the, the, the express lane. You know, I was a, I would have been an avid, rabid, you know, behind CAD, wearing like black turtlenecks with the funny glasses. <laughs> like doing the whole circuit, you know, cause I thought that architecture, in my mind, I'm only an architect, right? And all these other labels come to be, it was only just the timing and the small community that didn't have the surface area. And I thought that in a fashion, you know, we make things in like three weeks, three months, we show them, you know, I do 12 fashion shows. I'm responsible for 12 fashion shows a year that's just my natural pace at like start starting and completing an idea and then it's like as as james said it's on human bodies you know <laughs> like i couldn't even be in broadway because i'm sure that that takes too long or theater that takes too long but if you think like an architect if you if you warp the world like an artist all of a sudden if you blur the lines between all these disciplines then you have this like oh the world is the studio um so yeah I, I just love that like if you do architecture plus pretty much anything you start making up like 70 careers <laughs> <laughs> well also you, you you're rooted in a philosophy so if you're rooted in a, in a way of doing things a way of thinking 
you know, I find it pretty, pretty easy to just pass from one from outside to inside to on the wall. I, I, I used to kind of battle with it during the, you know, escape from the gallery period. But after a while, you get comfortable and you realize that as long as you carry the idea forward, and, uh, you know, you just, you just keep innovating with things that are, are just, I always like it's just on the edge of the expected, but then they're unexpected. It's almost like normal, but then it has some other different dimension. And that always fascinates me. That's just that turn. It's just like, again, it's like Quentin Tarantino so great. I mean, he just uses common language, the, the, the stuff you hear on the street every day, but he, he has this ear, this amazing ear, and that's it. And, and you do the same with fashion. I mean, it's, they're like other fashions, but you can tell the difference. I mean, you just, the minute you look, you know there's a difference. It just, and, I, and it's hard to explain. You, you sit down. I think that's like critics are so, they want everything in a box. They want to have an explanation for it. And if there's no explanation, it really is painful for their profession. I mean, it's a good point, just throwing it in there while, before we're moving to the next question. You know, we, we didn't talk much about how much uh, Willie actually pioneered and innovated. Uh, he created the artist t-shirt, he collaborated with Christo, things that are, you know, normal, quote unquote, today, uh, but they definitely weren't and they were rather outrageous at the time. And it took, you know, a considerable amount of time for the world to catch up with to that. He did the first video fashion show before Margiela for that matter, uh, a lot of collaborations with in dance and so on and so forth. So um, just speaking to the notion of what you were just saying, um, James, about things that can seem normal, like a t-shirt, but looking at them with a different, with a different, all a different yeah, agenda. Exactly. All of a sudden it's much more than a t-shirt. Right. Then it becomes something else that you really have to contemplate and think about. And, and, uh, which which to me is like you know when uh, i'm really stuck on my mind with james when you brought up the the sort of the formula of inside the institution you know paint the walls white put it on a pedestal put the lighting just so then anything looks like it should be you know you know in the louvre in however many hundreds of years or something like that but then you have duchamp who obviously you know he he unraveled that notion and then if you just take what awana said about willie smith you know this free thinking american coming to fashion from a, with a different set of circumstances you know he's diverse in in discriminate in like very distinct ways his his free thinking and innovation predates some of the canons that we thought <laughs> were like the beginning you know, Absolutely but right. it's all in how we view that, that, that the, the, the beauty stories or the iconic heroic moments of an industry exist. And when you, when you don't record those moments and when, the, when, when Willie isn't embraced, maybe in a way, then all of a sudden it's left off to the side. No, and that's just, those are just his stories to learn from, you know. What were you going to say? No, you're, you're absolutely right. This is very true. Because, and another thing that's interesting, I, mean, talk, I mentioned Duchamp. What Duchamp did was took advantage of all those expectations of overhead lights and pedestals. And did he use the pedestal like it was never used before? He used the frame like it was never used before. He, he always did. He put a urinal on a pedestal in an art gallery with conventional art. You blow the whole thing apart. <laughs> completely reassess where you are. And, and I think, but that had been going on for an awful long time. So it was kind of hard to violate or radicalize or so anything of that environment. So the next thing was the street. The street had not been radical, radicalized. And I Which, think we both appreciate that fact. I mean, you go to the street and you find, oh my God, here's, here's heaven out here. There's all this stuff. <laughs> It's just waiting to be attacked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, I, I look at it just very much the same. And to me, when you see those stories, the same with David Hammond, you yeah. know, I see a complete radical perceptive perception shift when 
you can categorize a whole emotion in gestures that are, you know, a flag that turns red, black, American flag that turns red, black, and green, or, you know, telephone poles that become basketball hoops yeah. or the blizzard sale. I saw someone in the comment, you know, I think that in this year of 2020, when we're sort of searching for answers, we're almost like, you know, I think our this conversation is perfect for a young generation who can unravel it and say the change that we want and the diversity that we want, you know, might be on what we're considering artists <laughs> that are on the fringe or, you know, or, or yeah. prodding at the canon in the, the unsafe way. You said it, Einstein was the best. I'm going to use that one. <laughs> <laughs> like, theory of relativity probably was a pain in his side. <laughs> he had to carry them around. And, and, and still, it's still valid. They're still working around it. I mean, <laughs> it's beyond belief, the, the power of that simple idea. And I, it's, it's, it's this advice to young designers. It's called Tips on the Top. Uh, it's a new book that's coming out. And I, I mentioned Einstein in that. And, and here he was, look at working as a patent clerk or something in, in Switzerland with the whole countries about time. But what do they mean by time? They mean you're on time, you're not on time, it's you're late, uh, you know, your time is up. They all everybody could tell you what time meant, except that he asked a very simple question. What is time? That's one simple question, and the most complex question of all time was. What is time? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure that's why everybody, everybody knows what time is. And, and that's what I would tell students, go back to something that everybody else has dismissed. Because the thing that everyone else has dismissed is where the juice is. <laughs> they dismiss it because they think that nobody would touch that with a 10 foot pole. Like no self-respecting uh, Harvard design student would have ever approach a you know, big box store. And, and I've said that many times in lectures. It is true. I mean, they disdain that world. That world was beneath contempt. You can't possibly get any high level of setting. You can't get a, you know, kind of an ultra theory out of a big box. Can you? Well, you can, obviously. To, to how tell you rethink it. To tie it back, James, to Willie, just briefly, I mean, he was not only, you know, creating from the streets, but he was also giving back. He was making his patterns publicly available for everyone. And there's lots of stories, actually, in this book, again, <laughs> which I where people do talk about finding those patterns and not even knowing necessarily about Willie, but but growing up with those clothes and making their own clothes. And, and, and in a way, the fact that this, it's a continuous process, you get inspired, but you're also kind of giving back. Um, I think is a great way. I'm just going to go through the questions, although the what is time is very hard to follow, but <laughs> I'll just do that, through them one by one. Okay, so one is uh, on a different note. So uh, as a young creative who is not in a place to be sure of his, her abilities and vision, how do you find the courage to do something that might not make sense in the current conventions? So where does one find courage? Do you have the choice to, to question whether you have courage or not? Oh boy. <laughs> well, uh, again, part of this thing I wrote for this advice to young designers and is the, the coronavirus thing has, has, and environmental tragedies have changed the world. There's no question. It's radically changed. So almost everything you think about design is going to change. I mean, it's just, it is. We've become you know, much more dependent on virtual communication, just as we're doing right now. Uh, buildings are going to be smaller. They're going to have to be much more energy efficient. They're going to have to be greener in every respect. Uh, you know, and there's all these conflicts. And here we have burgeoning populations in some countries, and they you're trying to make smaller buildings. So I mean, these there there's a lot of collisions that are going to be. So I would say that the, the threshold for new creativity is probably more urgent and, and more expansive than ever before. I mean, new creativity is just, I mean, I'm kind of old for this sort of thing, but you know, teenagers like Virgil and you can, <laughs> can do it, but I don't know. It's really like, it is, it is painful. I, I, I worry about it every day. I think about it. Like, what are we going to do that really addresses 
has changed the world. And certainly, you know, the arts do. I mean, the power of the arts during this whole thing. In fact, I think there was some survey recently and they asked people what they wanted the most. And, and I think in third place, I think after food and shelter was access to the arts. So it is a powerful force, no matter what it is. It, you can't explain it, but it's a powerful force. Yeah, no, I, you know, I've been on enough Zooms in this 2020 period yeah. with like a hardcore youthful crew trying to solve the world's yeah. ills. And, you know, what I've distilled ironically as we talk about, you know, critical approach, we talk about the institutions, yada, yada. Fundamentally, it's just information. You know, like if you were to, if you were to sort of find the common denominator in you know, Awana and I are teaching a class on like redesigning the digital system, you know, between Harvard and um, and Stanford. Um, but, you know, say my fashion shows, you know, I, I did a shirt in January that said, I support young black businesses just to open, just to using a graphic, it's like enough with this yeah. Parisian fashion. <laughs> You know, I felt that there was like something being missed and like, let's start the show with that. Or when James, when you'd say like, when you grab something off the street and that looks com way more compelling and interesting than something that's been manicured. Ultimately, what we're saying is we're just trying to rewire information. Yeah. You know, like even no matter what, Duchamp, David Hammond, you know, uh, uh, Einstein with the theory of relativity. What, what makes us unique is now we've had another go at it with humanity being frustrated with the establishment. So it's an omnipresent issue. And I think just pure information, access to information, like I'm glad that this is, talk will be on YouTube for other kids to just watch it and gleam information. That's our best effort at changing the world amongst other things, but that's the baseline. Yeah, it is. It's really true. Absolutely. And, and, and the arts are not going to go away, that's for sure. Yeah, but they'll just come back with, with, with the different messages, different stories. I mean, they, they just, they're inherent. They're in our DNA. They, they, so, I mean, I, I had these moments and I go, what the hell am I doing? Kind of conceptual art. Where does that stand in the great cosmic all when, you know, everything else is falling apart? But uh, it is a salvation. And as I say, when I think of the correspondence I'm having internationally now in China and Iran, different countries where, you know, I'm working with young people. I mean, the energy that, that they invest, uh, you know, it's really, it's, it's really incredible that they, that they it's, it's, I have this it, one young woman in, in Iran and in Karnia, and she's just extraordinary. I mean, she's, yeah, her her talent, her, her just she's gonna blitz the arts in the next ten years. You're you're gonna hear every about her work everywhere because she's just going from architecture to space to dance to performance to you know transformation. All of these things are just rushing ahead, and I know that you know and it's a very constricted situation, obviously, and uh, so it's it's very powerful. It's very very. very this, this next question actually speaks to the same thing. It says, Will Smith undoubtedly provided a blueprint for something far in the future, a future we haven't seen yet, actually. What conditions do you believe are necessary for either a community or an individual to have the capacity to imagine and build alternatives to the system that currently exists? Uh, Virgil, you take that one. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, there's I mean, a group of Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, in terms of, I don't know so much about conditions because I, in, in terms of context, I don't know that there is any better context than 2020 actually to start building or imagining an, an alternative to the systems that exist. And I'm just going to use briefly actually the just, justice system uh, class as an example. So the justice system or the law world you know, like altogether is extremely conservative and slow to change and actually doesn't change. So when we hear the system is broken, it's because it's always been broken. It's not because it suddenly broke or anything. Uh, but the amazing thing about this moment, because everything went digital really overnight, 
the justice system or essentially they are asking for help to redesign the system to adjust to the digital world. So they're has help, uh, asking for help to redesign the system, which next didn't happen historically, pretty much never in as far as like we, we understand. Um, so this is just one example in which the context today enables change. I know that's a little bit different to, to what the question was actually asking, but sorry, Virgil, go ahead. I kind of cut no, you off. I think, you know, what I'd like to see is sort of like baseline and, and different in a way where when I see, when I listen to Willie's story, right, you know, and the fact to me, you know, I want him to be a household name just the same way that, you know, if you go to someone on the street and you say, what's a name, you know, 10 great American designers, you know, in my own personal source of inspiration, I'd want him to be the first. And I think if you go down that sort of looking glass of uh, black American fashion designers, obviously, you know, there's a, there's parameters that make that, you know, evidently the case. And when I think of my time in New York City with Shane Oliver, who I consider one of the, you know, my generation's great fashion designers, ultra talented of my same school, you know, when James is talking about him and Willie hanging out and developing these ideas, you know, I believe that was my New York community when I was there. But as the fashion system, just like as you're talking about, any system that's not sort of representative of these holes needs needs more representation. You know, there's there's a group right now called uh, it's like Black Fashion Fair. There's these industry trade groups that are forming in the black black in fashion. And I think once those initiatives take root, we will see. American fashion designers that are black become household names, which ultimately is important. You know, when you talk about Jimi Hendrix playing yeah. the Star Spangled Banner at Woodstock, it's like, imagine if that piece of art didn't exist in the world because he was told that he wasn't a guitar player or he's playing it wrong, yeah. or he didn't have the one chance to, to perform at Woodstock and it was at a small, uh, East Village bar, <laughs> you know, we wouldn't be talking about it the same way. So I don't want to go too long, but you get my gist. It's this, the, 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 once the inequalities are corrected, all of a sudden the system is whole. Yeah, so I think that's really true. It, it, I mean, the problem is, is titanic. We're, we're on one side of the fence. We're on the, definitely on the safe side of the fence, I guess. But I realize that it's, you know, well, it's like, again, I, I, I am very self-critical. The fact that, the, you know, to me, the Midwest is somewhere you fly over. You go to San Francisco or LA and, and New York, and the rest is just this wasteland where all these Trumpites live, I guess. <laughs> I didn't want to mention his name. I thought it would ruin the whole conversation. But it is a, a problem because as, as intellectuals, as, you know, people who are successful in our own professions. It is, it is a tragic lack of dialogue. We really don't talk to these people who probably hate us and who have no opportunity to build a bridge to talk or to, to have this discourse. I mean, it's, it's, it's a painful thing. I, and I've, that's, that's another thing, I just don't know personally, how to address it. I mean, how, what would be our first sentence to a Trump voter? I, I, if, if somebody from Arkansas told me he was a pro-Trump and started to say, okay, let's have a conversation. I have absolutely no idea where our conversation would be. What would be the first words? What, where, would be, where would be the connection? And that's a tragic thing. That kind of division is tragic. And I think that the, you know, of all kinds of social racial problems in this country, they start with that gap. And if I can, if I can just jump in real quick, there, your work does that. Bingo. Bingo. <laughs> that's the only thing that does it. But that's, that's <laughs> an artifact of 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 the 
a fact that we're in, in the arts. The fact that Virgil and I are in the arts is in itself a, a privileged territory. I mean, you know, the people we, we talk to every day, they, I, I mean, they just, they're really not, they're kind of, and they, we work and we communicate in the, in the world and, and average people like it, but you know, the way we actually operate is, is pretty elitist. It really is. That's what I always feel like, you know, I'm talk, the way we're talking today is, I, I'm not sure how many Trump voters we're gonna have watch this. But in a way, I think that's why I wanted to 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 start uh, the talk with this notion of fun and joy or whatever, which seems contradictory. You were right. <laughs> I'm sad I dragged it down. But... No, 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 no. That's not what I meant. But really, because I feel what it does, and you know, you you sense a lot of that in reading reading about Will, Willie's um, story. There's vulnerability in that. And that, you know, the notion of either joy or emotions of any kind, they hit a little bit deeper beyond just the typical way in which we communicate now. Language is not always, I tend to believe, at least being an optimist and an architect, I guess, um, that language isn't always, for me at least, the most direct tool, as you can see right now, <laughs> to communicate certain points. But in a way, that's, our, that's the, what our work does, right? Like our work is able to or a, a good piece of work, artistic, architectural, or any other kind of music, hits you at a different spot in which words might not because they're rational. And I think the ability for, for artistry is to hit directly under the belt a little bit deeper and, and connect us hopefully there. But I'm an optimist and that's where I'm coming from. No, you're absolutely right. That, that is as true as it can be because I, I think we've been, we're gifted you know, aesthetically and intellectually. So, you know, thank heaven for that for that gift. But, but we, that's all we can do is what we do, and it was, it, we communicate. And so, I guess that's a good thing. To be said. Really, but I wish, it, you know, because it's, the, the causes are so urgent. I just wish we could do, you know, become more. But as we become more involved, I realize politically and everything, we're amateurs. We're really. You know, sociologists, you know, architects becoming sociologists now and everything, and, and, and scientists and everything, they, they're not really prepared that well. I mean, they know a little bit, but they're not really, that's not their best work, really. I mean, they contribute to an extent, but it, it isn't the same. On a lighter note, <laughs> <laughs> next question, or did you want to speak to that, Virgil? Mm -hmm. Uh, I was wondering, I do wonder, like, when you were hanging out with Willie, because to, a little bit to Awana's point, like, somewhere deep in the sort of deep in the nuance, we are combating the negativity through our work, even though it is elitist, and, and we all operate in a place of privilege, which is a fact. But when I see Willie's work, I see him investigating this idea of making his creations and seeing them on the street is very much how I get satisfaction that my work seen on the street is educating a 17 year old kid who's very far from an institution, very far from an elitist world because he has the internet or she has the ability to, 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 to see this lecture that all of a sudden they're contributing in a way that the this tall walls of our institutions were different did you find that willie was how was willie's thought you know that's my thought but how did you find willie's approach well i think willie uh it's kind of like this he he did the art first and and it worked and 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 it communicated and so the accomplishment was there without intellectualizing it uh we we never talked as i say we really didn't talk about social problems and you know, and we talked a little bit about the unfairness of the art world. I mean, the fact that it doesn't recognize somebody. I found it absolutely staggering when, when Alexander first said they were going to do a Willie Smith retrospective. I said, I, you know, I thought to you, where on earth, how did earth did his name fall to the side? And there's right. so many fashion houses totally 
predicated. I mean, all the big, you know, Ralph Lauren has street wear now. Every company, the large, you know, establishment company has street wear, you know, design, and they didn't ever before. That wasn't even a word in the vocabulary. So he had this tremendous influence. And I'm sure you're right. We, by doing what we do, we do influence. I mean, I certainly communicate every single day with young people. So we're changing somebody's mind. You know, Rauschenberg said it very well about painting. He said, if you go up to a painting you've never seen before and it doesn't change your mind about something, there's something wrong with you or there's something wrong with the painting. <laughs> That's absolutely true. Uh, because, yeah, he was a powerful artist. I mean, thrashed out his life in the most amazing way. And again, with a gay artist and, and just did extraordinary things. And uh, he, he, he was just, you know, that was his community. That was the contribution. And I do think the influence of that kind of contribution is, is essential. I, I think if we have any effect on that, from young people, just people growing up, somebody who thinks they have no hope and all of a sudden they see something and say, hey, you know, I can draw or I can think or I can write or anything. We just one spark, we've done our job. We really have. Which is perfect. We've also done our job for our next door design meeting. We don't even need to meet. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I we're meeting on Friday, I think so. Let's I'm, see. Now, now how do we pick a bathroom size? <laughs> like in more material. Uh, it seems like we have to wrap it, but I think James's point was really the perfect uh, uh, place to end it. Did, did you guys want to want to add any last words? Sorry. That was a pretty yeah. good place. I mean, what is, you know, there's a lot of questions in the Q&A. Sorry, we didn't get to all of them. Quite a lot, too, with with regards to Willie's story and and whether he was successful, I can tell you he was very successful actually. Um, and and his uh, I, I can only urge you to either read the book or um, and check the website out because the website does also have a lot of information. And before I go on to close, any James Virgil last call. No, you know, I think this is such an important, like, I'm glad, you know, there's a lot of Zooms happening. There's a lot of, of combination of minds. I think what we didn't even get to is the body of work that Awana and I have, like, in the can, or how James and I first met, and the premise that we met, you know, and I think it's like, we're not just telling these stories from the past as if they're just sort of great ones. I think they're important. You know, the fringe of architecture, the fringe between fashion and architecture will, will be where we pick up in 2021 and try to make sense of 2020, so. No, I, that's a good, a very good point. And I think also that I, I hope we can change, or hope the world will change the idea of success. Very often, you know, you know success in the arts is always considered, oh, well, they've gone commercial. And that's not really true at all. I mean, Willie, Willie was a prime example. I don't think he ever changed himself or, or his attitude or his intensity. I mean, having planned fashion weeks with him and in the office and just see the energy and the anxiety and the, the, the talent with which he did everything. I mean, yeah, he, he knew he was great. He knew he was successful, but so what else is new? You know, it's it's what you're doing now. You want to make it. You want to do it right. And, and I think that kind of energy that, that he communicated is is a, is a very very powerful message. And um, to add to that, I mean, and I think a lot of the questions to the to Q and A actually kind of hit the same direction. What was most striking for me in reading Willie's story actually was. Uh, that it like it just hit me that I only how how was it possible to only find out about him now at least to this extent how how is it possible that this book did not exist before um, and and 
the other thing that we have to remember is that Willy is part of a lineage of gay men and women who we lost much too soon due to AIDS crisis in the 80s. Uh, and it feels like we would desperately need them to be around to help us make sense of this this world. And you know, in many ways, they they actually are because culture would have not been the same today, uh, was it not for them. But I want to end with a Brendan Fernandez quote, one less quote from me, uh, also from the book. Um, but it's quite powerful because he says Willie Smith died at 39, the same the same age as Brendan was. How do, uh, how would the present look had there been more future for Smith? And how might we continue to disrupt and empower, to teach and poke fun? How might the style continue to facilitate crossings? These questions should face us not with regret, but with task. What future can we continue to imagine? What futures can we enact in our work and in how we face the world? What futures can we embody? And on that note, I want to thank James and I want to thank Virgil. I also want to thank curator and editor Alexandra Cunningham Karen. Cameron, Darnell Lisby, Julie Pastor, and Rebecca Armstrong, Willie Smith's friends and collaborate families, friend, family, friends, and collaborators, the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum for hosting us. And thank you to you, everyone, for joining us and have a wonderful evening. And please do not forget to vote. Thank you. That's for sure. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. See you Friday. <laughs> See you Friday.